Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Today is the 30th of the 11th month on our Creator's calendar. Tomorrow will be the 1st of the 12th, and we'll have 31 days left of winter before the 31st day, which is going to be equal day and night, as per the book of Hanok, chapter 72 at the end of it. And then the next day, which would be on the Gregorian calendar, the 16th of March, should be the 1st of the year where we should also see the full moon that night. So I know it says on the, it says if you can look online, it's, that it's on the 18th. And that's been something that's been known for a few years now that it's not going to line up right. So we're going to see if it, it does or not, and whether or not the scriptures and the things we've been following are accurate, or we need to adjust what we're doing because we're wrong. Scripture is never wrong. But since 2013, the pattern's been fitting just perfectly. I've personally witnessed it myself since 2016. And I expect that we'll continue to see the pattern. All but willing, we will be able to observe and know for certain. But we are continuing in our study of the recognitions of Clement today. So if you'll indulge us, this is chapter 31. Diligence and study. It says, but on the following day, or Yom, Kepha, as usual, rising before dawn, found us already awake and ready to listen, and thus began I entreat you, my brothers and fellow servants, that if any of you is not able to wake, he should not torment himself through respect to my presence, because sudden change is difficult. But if for a long time one gradually accustoms himself, that will not be distressing that comes to of use. For we had not all the same training, although in course of time we will be able to be molded into one habit. For they say that custom holds the place of a second nature. But I call Yahuwah to witness that I am not offended if anyone is not able to wake. But rather by this, if when anyone sleeps all through the night, he does not in the course of the day fulfill that which he omitted in the night. For it is necessary to give heed intently and unceasingly to the study of doctrine. This is another witness to having the word continually in your mind, right? It is necessary to give heed intently and unceasingly to the study of doctrine. It says in the Apostolic Constitutions that where the doctrine of Yahuwah is, there he is present, which is the same as when Yahushua said, when two or more are gathered in my name, I'm, I'm there with you, right? This is that our mind may be filled with the thought of Yahuwah only. Because in the mind that is filled with the thought of Yahuwah, no place will be given to the immoral one. And remember, Yahuwah is love. When Kepha spoke thus to us, every one of us eagerly assured him that we were already awake, being satisfied with short sleep, but that we were afraid to arouse him because it did not become the taught one's to command the master. And yet even this, O Kepha, we had almost ventured to take upon ourselves, because our hearts, agitated with longing for your words, drove sleep wholly or completely from our eyes. But again, our affection towards you opposed it and did not suffer us violently to rouse you. Then Kepha said, since therefore you assert that you are willing, sorry, willingly awake through desire of hearing, I desire to repeat to you more carefully and to explain in their order the things that were spoken yesterday without arrangement. And this I propose to do throughout these daily disputations, that by night when privacy of time and place is afforded, I will unfold in correct order and by a straight line of explanation, anything in the controversy that has not been stated with sufficient fullness. 
And then he began to point out to us how yesterday's discussion ought to have been conducted and how it could not be so conducted on account of the contentiousness or the unskillfulness of his opponent. And how, therefore, he only made use of assertion and only overthrew what was said by his adversary, but did not expound his own doctrines either completely or distinctly. Then repeating the several matters to us, he discussed them in regular order and with full reason. And remember, truth and reason have to go hand in hand because he who easily believes will also easily yield. But when the day began to be light, after prayer, he went out to the crowds and stood in his accustomed place for the discussion. And seeing Shimon standing in the middle of the crowd, he saluted the people in his usual way and said to them, I confess that I am grieved with respect to some men who come to us in this way that they may learn something. But when we begin to teach them, they profess that they themselves are masters. And while indeed they ask questions as ignorant persons, they contradict as knowing trees. And the, the idea behind that, if you're not familiar with the word for trees in Hebrew, is etz, right? And etza is counsel. But they contradict as knowing trees. But maybe someone will say that he who puts a question puts it indeed in order that he may learn. But when that which he hears does not seem to him to be right, it is necessary that he should answer. And that seems to be contradiction that is not contradiction, but further inquiry. Let such a one then hear this. The teaching of all doctrine has a certain order, and there are some things that must be delivered first, others in the second place, and others in the third, and so all in their order. And if these things be delivered in their order, they become plain, but they be brought forward out of order, they will seem to be spoken against reason. And therefore, order is to be observed above all things, if we seek for the purpose of finding what we seek. For he who enters rightly upon the road will observe the second place in due order, and from the second will more easily find the third. And the further he proceeds, so much the more will the way of knowledge become open to him, even until he arrive at the city of truth whether he is bound that at sorry and that he desires to reach but he who is unskillful and knows not the way of inquiry as a traveler in a foreign country is ignorant and wandering if he will not employ a native of the country as a guide undoubtedly he has strayed from the way of truth and will, re will remain outside the gates of life, and so, involved in the darkness of black night, will walk through the paths of perdition. Inasmuch, therefore, as if those things that are to be sought be sought in an orderly manner, they can most easily be found. But the unskillful man is ignorant of the order of inquiry. It is right that the ignorant man should yield to the knowing one and first learn the order of inquiry, that so at length he may find the method of asking and answering. To this, Shimon replied, then truth is not the property of all, but of those only who know the art of disputation, which is absurd, for it cannot be, since he is equally the Elohim of all that all should not be equally able to know his will. Then Kepha, and whenever we're listening to these arguments, you might be persuaded to agree with Simon in something that he says, well, yeah, that sounds reasonable. But if you tie it into what scripture says, it's not true. You look at what scripture shows who revealed the will of our maker. There's one, and he makes it known to only a chosen few 
that are approved by him to go out and show the truth. And this is a pattern that's repeated. So you can clearly see in the evidence of scripture that that's not accurate. And that's how we should view all of reality basing what we hear, see on what he said and whether or not it's true or right. This is then Kepha. All were made equal by him and to all he has given equally to be receptive of truth but that none of those who are born are born with education, but education is subsequent to birth, no one can doubt. Since therefore the birth of men holds equity in this respect, that all are equally capable of receiving discipline. The, dis sorry, the difference is not in nature, but in education. Who does not know that the things which anyone learns, he was ignorant of before he learned them? Then Shimon said, you say truly. Then Kepha said, if then in those arts that are in common use, one first learns and then teaches, how much more ought one or ought those who profess to be educators of Ruach Oath or inner beings first to learn and so to teach that they may not expose themselves to ridicule if they promise to afford knowledge to others when they themselves are unskillful. Then Shimon, this is true in respect of those arts that are in common use, but in the word of knowledge, as soon as anyone has heard, he has learned. Then said Kepha, if indeed one hear in an orderly and regular manner, he is able to know what is true, but he who refuses to submit to the rule of a reformed life and a pure behavior, which truly is the proper result of knowledge of the truth, will not confess that he knows what he does know. For this is exactly what we see in the case of some who, abandoning the trades that they learned in their youth, betake themselves to other performances, and by way of excusing their own sloth, begin to find fault with the trade as unprofitable. Then Shimon, at all who hear to believe that whatever they hear is true. Then Kepha, whoever hears an orderly statement of the truth cannot by any means gainsay it, but knows that what is spoken is true, provided he also willingly submit to the rules of life. But those who, when they hear, are unwilling to betake themselves to good works, are prevented by the desire of doing evil from acquiescing in those things that they are judged to, or sorry, that they judge to be right. Hence, it is manifest that it is the power of the hearers to choose which of the two they prefer. But if all who hear were to obey, it would be rather a necessity of nature leading it all in one way. For as no one can be persuaded to become shorter or taller, because the force of nature does not permit it, so also if either all were converted to the truth by a word, or all were not converted, it would be the force of nature that compelled all in one case, or all in the one case, or none at all in the other, to be converted. Then Shimon or sorry, then said Shimon, inform us therefore what he who desires to know the truth must first learn. Then Kepha, before all things, it must be inquired what is the purpose for man to find out, or sorry, what is, sorry, let me start over. Before all things, it must be inquired what it is possible for man to find out. For of necessity, the judgment of Yahuwah turns upon this, if a man was able to do good and did it not. And therefore, men must inquire whether they have it in their power by seeking to find what is good and to do it when they have found it. For this is that for which they are to be judged. But more than this, there is no occasion for anyone but a foreteller to know. For what is the need for men to know how the world was made? 
This indeed would be necessary to be learned if we had to enter upon a similar construction. But now it is sufficient for us in order to the worship of Yahuwah to know that he made the world. But how he made it is no subject of inquiry for us, because as I have said, it is not incumbent upon us to inquire the knowledge of that art, as though we were about to make something similar. But neither are we to be judged for this, why we have not learned how the world was made, but only for that, if we be without knowledge of its creator. For we will know that the creator of the world is the righteous and good Yahuwah, if we seek him in the paths of righteousness. By doing what he said. Right? It is righteousness for us when we, we guard to do all the words of this Torah. For if we only know regarding him, and just so you guys are aware, we'll cover it sometime. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a literal injunction that says that the, the, the righteous or the intelligent will go through every law and statute from former times until now to find out what's still applicable and how it applies to your life or if it does. And that's something that I know Brother Earl was talking about, that we need to get more <coughs> squared away or profitable on what the law is and how to be uh, abiding by it. But Richard, would that not validate Hebrews 10? Uh, I, I, I usually use it. First, you must believe that he is. It doesn't say first. But, but in the discussion of faith and belief, you must believe that he is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That would seem to answer the question I asked earlier. What is the first thing to do? Certainly. The first thing to learn. Yeah. And then, yeah, certainly that sounds, and that's how we have to do everything. You, you build it, but you got to always two or more witnesses to confirm every matter. And that's the process also that we'll see throughout this book. Kepha, the whole thing in the process of going through this story teaches anyone that wants to learn how to teach or how to share the information to have it be effectual and in the proper order for doing so, which is what he's going over, right? It's just, it's done sloppily because it's in the midst of having disputations with someone who's acting adversarial, but you get to see the contrast of someone walking in his Ruach and someone walking in this, you know, the Ruach of the adversary. That's a good one. Thank you for pointing that one out, though. It does go in line with it. We'll start again right here, though. It says, for if we only know regarding him that he is good, such knowledge is not sufficient for deliverance. For in the present life, not only the worthy, but also the unworthy enjoy his goodness or tobim and his benefits. But if we believe him to be not only good, but also righteous, and if, according to what we believe concerning Yahuwah, we observe righteousness in the whole course of our existence or life, we will enjoy his goodness forever. In a word, to the Hebrews, whose opinion concerning Yahuwah was that he is only good, our master said that they should seek also his righteousness. That is, that they should know that he is good indeed in this present time that all may live in his goodness or tobim, but that he will be righteous at the day of judgment to bestow ageless rewards upon the worthy, from which the unworthy will be excluded. Then Shimon, how can one and the same being be both good and righteous? Kepha answered, because without righteousness, goodness would be unrighteousness. For it is the part of a good Elohim to bestow his sunshine and rain equally on the righteous and the unrighteous. But this world, or but this would seem to be unrighteous if he treated the good and the bad always with equal fortune, and were it not that he does it for the sake of the fruits, which all may equally enjoy who are born in this world. But as the rain given by Elohim equally nourishes the corn and the tares, but at the time of harvest the crops are gathered into the barn, 
but the chaff of, or the tares are burnt in the fire. So in the day of judgment, when the righteous will be introduced into the Malkuth Shemaim, and the unrighteous will be cast out, then also the righteousness of Elohim will be shown. For if he remained forever alike to the evil and the good, this would not only not be good, but even unrighteous and unjust, it says, or not, not equal, not right ruling, right? That the righteous and the unrighteous should be held by him in one order of desert. Then said Shimon, the one point on which I desire to be satisfied is whether the Ruach oath, or this is supposed to say inner being, it's consistently translated as spirit in the text for some reason. And I actually asked Jackson about this. I don't, I don't know if I ever got a response from it in an email, but um, Jackson Snyder, the one that wrote this translation, the, this word right here should be inner being or what we call nefesh in Hebrew. It's usually translated as soul. Okay. This is the one point on which I should desire to be satisfied is whether the inner being is immortal for I cannot take up the burden of righteousness unless I know first concerning the immortality of the inner being. For indeed, if it is not in immortal, the profession of your preaching cannot stand. Then said Kepha, let us first inquire whether Yahuwah is righteous. For if this were ascertained, the perfect order of obedience would straightway be established. Then Shimon, with all your boasting of your knowledge of the order of discussion, you seem to me now to have answered contrary to order. For when I ask you to show whether the inner being is immortal, you say that we must first inquire whether Elohim is righteous. Then said Kepha, this is perfectly right and regular. Shimon, I should wish, you, I should wish to learn how. Listen then, said Kepha, some men who are blasphemers against Yahuwah and who spend their whole life in unrighteousness and pleasure die in their own bed and obtain honorable burial, while others who worship Yahuwah and maintain their life frugally with all honesty and sobriety die in deserted places for their observance of righteousness, so that they are not even thought worthy of burial. Where then is the righteousness of Yahuwah, if there be no immortal inner being to suffer punishment in the future for disobedient deeds, or enjoy rewards for piety and righteousness? Then Shimon said, It is this indeed that makes me incredulous, because many well-doers perish miserably, and again many evildoers finish long lives pleasantly. Then said Kepha, this very thing that draws you into incredulity affords to us a certain conviction that there will be a judgment. For since it is certain that Yahuwah is righteous, it is a necessary consequence that there is another world in which everyone receiving according to his deserts will prove the righteousness of Yahuwah. But if all men were now receiving according to their deserts, we should truly seem to be deceivers when we say that there is a judgment to come. And this is the same thing that Shaul says. It says, if we only have this life to expect, we are, the, we are the most wretched of all men, right? It's the same theme. If the resurrection wasn't true, if the, if the inner being wasn't immortal, and you didn't have these things to look forward to in the next world, their, their preaching would have been for no effect. But it was very effective, and it still will be. It says, but if all men were now receiving to their deserts, we should truly seem to be deceivers when we say that there is a judgment to come. And therefore, the very fact that in the present life, a return is not made to everyone according to his deeds, affords to those who know that Yahuwah is righteous, an indutable, so not able to be doubted, proof that there will be a judgment. 
Then said Shimon, Why then am I not persuaded of it? Kepha, because you have not heard Yahushua saying, First seek his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Then said Shimon, Pardon me if I am unwilling to seek righteousness before I know if the inner being is immortal. Then Kepha, You also pardon me this one thing, because I cannot do otherwise than the foreteller of truth has instructed me. Then said Shimon, It is certain that you cannot assert that the inner being is immortal. And therefore you cavil, knowing that if it be proved to be mortal, the whole profession of that obedience that you are attempting to propagate will be plucked up by the roots. And therefore, indeed, I commend your prudence while I do not approve your pervasiveness. For you persuade many to embrace your, your obedience and to submit to the restraint of pleasure in hope of future Tob things to whom it occurs that they lose the enjoyment of things present and are deceived with hopes of things future. For as soon as they die, their inner being will at the same time be extinguished. Yet, what does Cavill mean? Cavill, when you, um, you rile against, when, or let me look that up so that you're... I'm I don't understand. think I've ever seen that word in my life. <laughs> to antagonize. Yeah. Uh, uh, holler, put him down. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's it's kind of a mob reaction. Yeah, I, I said to rile against, right? That that's kind of like here it says to make petty or unnecessary objections, to complain, complain carp, grumble, yeah. moan. I've heard that, uh, and uh, that's a, a, a slang of it in Brooklyn. They they say, well, "Are you kvetching again?" <laughs> yeah. You Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Splitting hair. Yeah, they, they got a thing for it. Okay. So anytime you guys have stuff like that too, and I, I do it anytime I get to a word I don't know, always look it up because otherwise, what's the point, right? You, you read and you don't get what you're trying to read. There's no point to it. That's why I interrupted because I don't think I've ever seen that word before. Okay. So now you have a little more context, right? I've increased right. my vocabulary. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is chapter 42, full of all subtlety and all mischief. Yet Kepha, when he heard him speak thus, grinding his teeth and rubbing his forehead with his hand and sighing with profound grief, said, armed with the cunning of the old serpent, you stand forth to deceive inner beings. And therefore, as the serpent is more subtle than any other beast, you profess that you are a teacher from the beginning. And, like the serpent, you wish to introduce many Elohim. But now being confuted in that, you assert that there is no Elohim at all. For by occasion of I know not what, unknown Elohim, you denied that the creator of the world is Yahuwah, but asserted that he is either an evil being or that he has many equals or as we have said, that he is not Elohim at all. And when you had been overcome in this position, you now assert that the inner being is mortal, so that men may not live righteously and uprightly in hope of things to come. For if there be no hope for the future, why should not mercy be given up, and men indulge in luxury and pleasures? from which it is manifest that all unrighteousness springs. And while you introduce so disobedient a doctrine into the miserable life of men, you call yourself obedient and me disobedient, because under the hope of future good things, I will not suffer men to take up arms and fight against one another, plunder and subvert everything, and attempt whatsoever lust may dictate. And what will be the condition of that life that you would introduce, that men will attack and be attacked, be enraged and disturbed, and live always in fear? Something that we've been living through for how many wars now? We just keep fighting and fighting because we're working for our enemy and don't know better. 
For those who do evil to others must expect the like evil to themselves. Do you see that you are a leader of disturbance and not of shalom, of inequity and not of equity? But I feigned anger, not because I could not prove that the inner being is immortal, but because I pity the inner beings that you are endeavoring to deceive. I will speak, therefore, but not as compelled by you, for I know how I should speak. And you will be the only one who wants not so much persuasion as admonition on this subject. But those who are really ignorant to this, I will instruct as it is suitable. Then says Shimon, If you are angry, I will neither ask you any questions, nor do I wish to hear from you. Then Kepha, if you are now seeking a pretext for escaping, you have full liberty and need not use any special pretext, for all have heard you speaking all amiss and have perceived that you can prove nothing, but that you only asked questions for the sake of contradiction, which anyone can do. For what difficulty is there in replying after the clearest proofs have been adduced? You have said nothing to the purpose but that you may know that I am able to prove to you in a single sentence that the inner being is immortal. I will ask you with respect to a point that all know. Answer me, and I will prove to you in one sentence that it is, Im or that it is immortal. Then Shimon, who had thought that he had got from the anger of Kepha a pretext for departing, stopped on account of the remarkable promise that was made to him, and said, Ask me then, and I will answer of what all or I will answer you what all know, that I may hear in a single sentence as you have promised, that the inner being is immortal. Then Kepha, <clears throat> I will speak so that it may be proved to you before all the rest. Answer me therefore. Which of the two can better persuade an incredulous man, seeing or hearing? Then Shimon said, seeing. Then Kepha, why then do you wish to learn from me by words what is proved to you by the thing itself and by sight? Then Shimon, I know not what you mean. Then Kepha, if you do not know, Go now to your house and entering the inner bedroom, you will see an image placed containing the figure of a murdered boy clothed in purple. Ask him, and he will inform you either by hearing or seeing. For what need is there to hear from him if the inner being is immortal, when you see it standing before you? For if it were not in being, it assuredly could not be seen. But if you know not what image I speak of, let us straightway go to your house with ten other men of those who are here present. And that was pretty much calling him out on the witchcraft that he's involved in and exposing that as a proof of the inner being being immortal because he himself had already witnessed these things before his eyes. Although Kepha explains both beforehand and later on that he's deluded by demons it's not really the inner being of a boy he's seen, but a demon that manifests to him. This is, yet Shimon hearing this and being smitten by his conscience changed color and became bloodless. For he was afraid if he denied it that his house would be searched or that Kepha in his indignation would betray him more openly. And so all would learn what he was. Thus he answered, I beseech you, Kepha, by that good Elohim who is in you, to overcome the immorality that is in me. Receive me to repentance, and you will have me as an assistant in your preaching. For now I have learned in very deed that you are a foreteller of the true Elohim, and therefore you alone know the secret and hidden things of men. Then said Kepha, you see, brother Shimon seeking repentance. In a little while, you will see him returning again to his infidelity. 
for thinking that I am a foreteller, for as much as I have disclosed his immorality, which he supposed to be secret and hidden, he has promised that he will repent. But it is not lawful for me to lie, nor must I deceive whether this infidel be delivered or not delivered. For I call Shemaim and earth to witness. You, you see, he's pointing out, it doesn't matter what other people believe. It's not permitted for him to speak things that are not true. And so he's going to do the right thing regardless of what others might do. And that's what every one of us has to make that choice. But it is not lawful for me to lie, nor must I deceive whether this infidel be delivered or not delivered. For I call Shemaim and earth to witness that I spoke not by a foretold, foretelling ruach what I said and what I intimated or hinted as far as was possible to the listening crowds. But I learned from some who once were his associates in his works, but have now been converted to our belief, what things he did in secret. Therefore, I spoke what I knew not what I foreknew. But when Shimon heard this, he assailed Kepha with curses and reproaches, saying, Most immoral and most deceitful of men, to whom fortune, not truth, has given the victory. But I sought repentance not for defective knowledge, but in order that you, thinking that by repentance I should become your taught one, might entrust to me all the secrets of your profession. And so at length, knowing them all, I might confute you. But as you cunningly comprehended or understood for what reason I had presented teshuva or repentance and acquiesced as if you did not comprehend my stratagem, that you might first expose me in the presence of the people as unskillful, then foreseeing that being thus exposed to the people, I must of necessity be or necessity, be indignant, and confess that I was not truly penitent, you anticipated me, that you might say that I should, after my repentance, again return to my infidelity, that you might seem to have conquered on all sides, both if I continued in the repentance that I had professed, and if I did not continue, and so you should be believed to be wise, because you had foreseen these things, while I should seem to be deceived, because I did not foresee your trick. But you, foreseeing mine, have, he's admitting that he was playing tricks right here, right? But you, foreseeing mine, have used subtlety and circumvented me. But as I said, your victory is the result of fortune, not of truth. And this is something that those that don't hold to his word or are believers in the truth will hold to fortune, to fate or luck, if you will, and not that it's the truth of Elohim who holds the law of all things in his hand, and you're only ever successful or not by his will alone. Right. This is yet, I know why I did not foresee this, because I stood by you and spoke with you in my goodness and bore patiently with you. But now I will show you the power of my divinity, it says, so that you will quickly fall down and worship me. And if you remember, there, it says in the, the Renewed Covenant that many anti mishiach have come, and one of those signs is that will, they will exalt themselves above all that is worshipped or called Elohim. This is the buddings of that kind of thing before it was fully manifest just so you can see that. And it's intimately involved in witchcraft, which is the mockery religion for the, the other side, right? But right here, it says, and I am the first power, and this is Simon, when he said to be the, the power of Elohim in the book of Acts, right? He goes, I am the first power who is always and without beginning. But having entered the womb of Rachel, I was born of her as a man, that I might be visible to men. I have flown through the air, 
I have been mixed with fire and made and been made one body with it. I have made statues to move. I have animated lifeless things. I have made stones bread. I have flown from mountain to mountain. I have moved from place to place upheld by messengers' hands and have lighted on the earth. Not only have I done these things, but even now I am able to do them, by, that by facts I may prove to all that I am the son of Elohim, enduring to eternity, and that I can make those who believe on me endure in like manner forever. But your words are all vain, nor can you perform any real works such as I have now mentioned, as he also who sent you is a magician who yet could not deliver himself from the suffering of the stake. To this speech of Shimon, Kepha answered, Do not meddle with the things that belong to others. For that you are a magician, you have confessed and made manifest by the very deeds that you have done. But our master, who is the son of Yahuwah and of man, is manifestly good, and that he is truly the son of Yahuwah has been told, and will be told to those to whom it is fitting. But if you will not confess that you are a magician, let us go with all this multitude to your house, and then it will be evident who is a magician. While Kepha was speaking thus, Shimon began to assail him with blasphemies and curses, that he might make a riot and excite all so that he could not be refuted, and that Kepha, withdrawing on account of his blasphemy, might seem to be overcome. But he stood fast and began to charge him more vehemently. So you remember earlier that Kepha said, you see, I didn't run from your blasphemies because you yourself will have to give an account for the things that you say. And he still is holding to that same pattern. Right? But it says, then the people in indignation, in indignation cast Shimon from the court and drove him forth from the gate of the house. And only one person followed him when he was driven out. Then silence being obtained, Kepha began to address the people in this manner. And pay attention to what was just happening to him, right? And then what, what does he say in response? He says, you ought, brothers, to bear with immoral men patiently, knowing that although Yahuwah could cut them off, yet he suffers them to remain even till the day appointed, in which judgment will pass upon all. Why then should not we bear with those whom Yahuwah suffers? Why should not we bear with fortitude the wrongs that they do to us, when he who is almighty does not take vengeance on them? that both his own goodness and the impiety of the immoral may be known. But if the immoral one had not found Shimon to be his minister, he would doubtless have found another. For it is of necessity that in this life offenses come, but woe to that man by whom they come. And therefore Shimon is rather to be mourned over, because he has become a choice vessel for the immoral one, which undoubtedly would not have been had he not received power over him for his former, excuse me, for his former sins. For why should I further say that he once believed in our Yahushua and was persuaded that inner beings are immortal, although in this he is deluded by demons, Yet he has persuaded himself that he has the inner being of the murdered boy ministering to him in whatever he pleases to employ it in, in which truly, as I have said, he is deluded by demons. And therefore, I spoke to him according to his own ideas. For he has learned from the Yahudim that judgment and vengeance are to be brought forth against those who set themselves against the true belief and do not repent. But here are men to whom, as being perfect in crimes, the immoral one appears that he may deceive them so that they may never be turned to repentance. And the same thing where the immoral one appears to them 
the same thing happened with like Muhammad or Ignatius, these men who had visions and caves from a messenger of light and had perverted beliefs from it, okay, that are contrary to the truth. It's a pattern there. Kepha's benediction. You, therefore, who are turned to Yahuwah by repentance, bend to him your knees. And when he had said this, all the multitude bent their knees to Yahuwah. And Kepha, looking towards Shemaim, prayed for them with tears that Yahuwah, for his goodness, would deny to receive those betaking themselves to him. And after he had prayed and had instructed them to meet early the next day, he dismissed the multitude. Then, according to custom, having taken food, we went to sleep. And then the next parts where he'll get on in the mornings from now on, it'll always be with his preaching without Shimon being there. So it'll be a little more to the point and he'll get his doctrines properly asserted in the right manners as he wanted to in the course of doing it just one moment <clears throat> 